Hello and welcome. My name is Zach Zetterberg and I'm the Curator of Art and the Center for American Decoys here at the museum. I would like to take you on a brief tour of an exciting new exhibition called Folk, which is currently on display in the Oberhelben River Gallery. Folk showcases over 20 folk art objects from our permanent collection, which holds over 500 folk art objects. Most of the objects within our folk art collection were brought to the museum by the extraordinary Illinois folk art collector and longtime friend of the museum, Merle Glick of Pekin. Merle's passion for folk art, specifically Illinois folk art, is well represented in this exhibition, and I hope you enjoy this brief tour of these fascinating objects. Folk art, in its essence, are objects often functional, created by common people who had little to no formal art training and are recognized as objects of art because of their aesthetic beauty and historical significance. The objects showcased in folk include everything from paintings and carvings to quilts, whirligigs, and weather vanes. As you enter this exhibition, you are greeted by several pieces created by the extraordinary Illinois folk artist William Nair of Shinoa, Illinois. Nair was the community photographer for the small city of Shinoa for over 40 years. His photography business, which supported his wife and eight children, operated out of a small studio in downtown Shinoa that Nair built with his own two hands. But fishing and carving were the artist's lifelong passions, which he pursued at every possible opportunity. Nair pursued his passions by creating hundreds of unique wood and concrete sculptures. He never sold a piece of his work during his lifetime and simply thought of it as a pleasurable hobby. As we move further into the exhibition, you will see a large red and white birdhouse but this is no ordinary birdhouse. This house, made by August Carlston in 1892, was made specifically for purple martins, the largest swallow in North America. Purple martins and humankind have a long history of working together. Centuries ago, Native Americans hung hollowed out gourds from tree branches for purple martins to live in. Today, purple martins rely solely on highly specific human-made structures to live in between their winter migration. If a house does not meet the requirements, the birds will not nest. However, if it is suitable, a group of purple martins will return to the same house year after year. This ornate, conventional style of purple martin house borrows elements from Gothic architecture, such as the pointed spires and centered arches. As we continue, you will see a beautiful vase made by the Kirkpatrick Pottery Company. In 1859, Cornwall and Wallace Kirkpatrick settled in Anna, Illinois and established Kirkpatrick Pottery, commonly known today as Anna Pottery. This versatile and prolific enterprise, which existed from 1859 to 1896, became one of the principal producers of stoneware containers and reed stem tobacco pipes in the Midwest. The Kirkpatrick brothers are known best for their pig flask and snake jugs, but their success was achieved through the distribution of utilitarian items such as large mixing bowls, crocks, churns, stoneware buckets, tableware, hand-thrown drainage pipe, fruit jars, jugs, and literally millions of roof tiles for buildings. This vase, which has been a part of the museum's permanent collection since 1967, is still one of the highlights of our permanent collection. As we round the corner, you will find three extraordinary examples of American pottery from the collection of Randy and Nancy Root. Randy has been a leading folk art advisor for years here at the museum, specifically for the Center for American Decoys, and I'm excited he agreed to share these redware dishes for this exhibition. For centuries, earthenware has been the most commonly made pottery of Western civilizations and was mass produced to create utilitarian vessels during the colonial period of early America. The term redware is applied when using clay with a high iron content, which turns reddish brown when fired. This iron rich clay is also used to produce common bricks. Due to its porous quality and and its function in the kitchen, redware needed to be waterproofed. It was often sealed with a lead-based glaze, which proved to be toxic over time. These functional wares were often decorated with pattern, figurative designs, and text using a slurry of clay and water called slip. Early American potters were often trained in Europe before immigrating to the colonies. They brought with them folk traditions that established distinct regional characteristics to pottery made across the country. These three plates were produced by potteries in Norwalk, Connecticut, which was a major center for redware production 
and renowned for its use of text to create slip decoration. These examples are a great complement to the Anna Pottery vase we just looked at. Adjacent to the three pieces of the redware are two insightful paintings by Illinois folk painter Olaf Kranz of Bishop Hill, a small colony founded in 1846 by Swedish immigrants and followers of the spiritual leader Eric Janssen. Bishop Hill, Illinois, also known as Utopia on the Prairie, was once home to Olaf Kranz, one of the state's most celebrated folk art painters. The colony was established by 400 self-proclaimed Janssenites, who traveled from Sweden for three arduous months to see to free themselves of religious persecution. As a 12-year-old in 1850, Olaf Kranz immigrated to Bishop Hill with his parents, arriving shortly after the assassination of leader Erik Janssen. At the onset of the Civil War in 1861, while Kranz was serving in the Union Army, Bishop Hill was also experiencing civil unrest and disbanded, leaving Kranz with an unstable community to return to. Ultimately, he settled in Galva, Illinois, where he honed his self-taught approaches to painting for the next 47 years as a house and commercial sign painter. Inspired by the 50th anniversary of the founding of Bishop Hill in 1896, Kranz began painting memories of his time spent there. These paintings, which provide an unprecedented window into the history of Bishop Hill, depict scenes of everyday life, as well as significant numbers of portraits of the men and women that inhabited this unique Midwest society. I would like to show you two more objects before we end the tour, and that would be these two jacquard coverlets made right here in Illinois. They are called jacquard coverlets because they were made using a jacquard attachment, which is a mechanism attached to a loom that simplified the process of weaving complex patterns by utilizing an interchangeable punch card system, much like the system used for early computer programming. The machine and the system were named after their inventor, Joseph Jacquard, who created them in 1805. In the early 19th century, Jacquard coverlets were more common than quilts. By the 1840s, coverlet weaving had become very competitive along the East Coast in areas of Pennsylvania and Ohio. But due to the increase in industrialization and the introduction of water and steam powered looms, traditional hand weavers started looking further west for new markets to support their craft. At the time, Illinois was still considered the frontier. The allure of readily obtainable property and the ability to continue their craft provoked numerous coverlet weavers to relocate to Illinois. From 1841 to 1871, only 18 weavers produced coverlets in Illinois, and from those weavers, only 126 examples exist today. Fortunately, all Illinois coverlets have a corner block that identifies the weaver, the location, and usually the year of production. The art of weaving fancy jacquard coverlets subsided in the middle of the 19th century as power looms quickly took over and cost-effective fabrics became fashionable. Today, these extraordinary works of art attest to the profound impact of this revolutionary invention and the beauty of early American material culture. I hope you enjoyed hearing the stories of these incredible objects. Thank you to everyone who has made this exhibition possible, including the members of the museum and the members of the Visionary Society. Also, thank you to everyone who has contributed to the museum's collection over the years. Your contributions are greatly appreciated and without you, exhibitions like this would not be possible. Thank you.